when you guys first met and were dating, I was curious, when did the discussion of, I'm in the CIA and I can never tell you about certain things, <laughs> when did that happen and what was that like? Well, I'll let Valerie speak. She's the one who said it, but I, I came at a moment when we were beginning to think about whether or not we, we would like to take this relationship to the next level. The CIA does not permit me to acknowledge any CIA affiliation prior to 2002. So um, I will simply say that when we met, it was love at first sight. And um, one thing I really liked about the film was sort of the look at, I guess, what one would call the, the sort of unglamorous side of spy life compared to what we see in the movies. <laughs> How do you feel that that was addressed in the, in the film and, and, um, and what are some other kind of things about the normal day of a spy? Well, I know that the director, Doug Liman, very much wanted it to be an accurate portrayal. And uh, Hollywood tends to make it seem as though this CIA is this super high tech and to, very efficient, and it, it does do many things well. But uh, the scenes where it's sort of the bullpen and uh, Naomi is, is working there at CIA headquarters, they are very accurate. Uh, and uh, like any job, it has its day-to-day uh, -day, uh, routine, but it's uh, punctuated by moments of uh, sheer adrenaline. And, um, and I saw in one of your interviews you talked about um, the idea of living your cover. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain sort of what, uh, what that means to you? Uh, well, that's what pro provides you protection. Uh, it, is, it really should be seamless, no matter what your cover is. Uh, most people take you at your word when you say you're a reporter or you're a doctor, or whatever it is. And, and you should know enough about that and should be able to carry it and, in fact, uh, even if you're under, say, commercial cover, you should, in fact, be making a profit on your venture, whatever it is. Uh, and, uh, in fact, when behind the scenes, you were collecting intelligence for U.S. policymakers. A while back, I interviewed um, Daniel Ellsberg, and I was asking about sort of what would his advice be for maybe, I mean, I don't know if what you'd call yourself a whistleblower, but in terms of for someone who has information that they want to get up, they feel that any administration is being dishonest about it, and considering your experience, uh, what kind of advice or thoughts would you have for someone like that? Well, I think, I think Dan Ellsberg um, <clears throat> um, made a, a morally and politically courageous decision when he leaked um, 9,000 or 7,000 pages of classified documents, which later became known as the Pentagon Papers. I'd like to remind people that mine, um, my contribution was 1,500 words, an article entitled What I Didn't Find in Africa. And so while I think that Dan's uh, was a very real exercise in political and moral courage, mine was simply an exercise in good citizenship. I think the lesson from my experience really is if you love this republic and you want to keep it strong, uh, citizens have responsibilities and first and foremost amongst them is to make sure that the government understands they work for us, not vice versa. I, I actually hope that the lesson of the movie is that uh, yes, we can, absolutely. Hell, if Joe Wilson can do that, so can we. I hope that mayors and city representatives and county representatives and state representatives, as well as U.S. congressmen, senators and presidents, all find their inboxes full of notes from people saying, get on with the job. This is what's wrong and you need to do something about it and you work for me, I'm a citizen, and I'm going to hold you to account for your actions. I've always thought this about about the about going to war with Iraq. That it seemed to me that if we knew that they had WMD, then we probably wouldn't have attacked because that would have increased the chances that they would have been used. Is that a correct assessment of, of that? Well, you know, I was I of course was in charge of the embassy in Baghdad during the first Gulf War, and that was something we we really labored over as we thought about how to best pr 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 um, protect our troops. And in fact, when Jim Baker was in Geneva with Tariq Aziz just before the uh, Desert Shield turned into Desert Storm just before the launching of Desert Storm. He made it very clear to Tariq Aziz that if you use weapons of mass destruction, we reserve the right to use every weapon in our arsenal to counter that. But these are very, very heavy decisions, and, um, and they weigh heavily on the people who have to make those decisions. I know that having been part of that decision-making process. And I would add that in the run-up to the war, I didn't have an opinion on that. <clears throat> that wasn't my job. Uh, in 1998, the UN inspectors were kicked out of Iraq by Saddam Hussein. We had no embassy there. So when, after the attacks of 9-11, when clearly the administration began focusing quite intently on Iraq, uh, the intelligence that we had on that was extremely thin. There was no doubt in my mind that had they indeed possessed WMD, 
he would use it. I mean, Saddam Hussein had done that previously, of course, against his own people. But our job as intelligence officers was to find what was the state of their research? Were, how far along were they? Did they have in their presumed nuclear program? Um, what, where, do, you know, where were they uh, procuring their material? Where were they, uh, what were they doing? And uh, we were all frantically working on that. And it wasn't until, uh, from in my case, when I saw then Secretary of State Colin Powell speak before the UN, I felt this great, a profound sense of unease because his words did not match what I knew the intelligence to be. And I found that uh, very uh, distressing. And I guess the uh, last question, I, I tend to ask this of everyone we inter I interview, but um, what are some movies, I guess, in, in your life that made you get interested in the work you're doing or just changed your, mm. changed your life or changed the way you looked at the world? Mm. Well, a friend of mine who actually produced Max, a movie about, um, Hitler before he was before he was um, uh, chancellor <laughs> before he was Hitler uh, said to me just the other day he'd seen the movie he said he thought it was um, all the president's men meets high noon um, which I, high noon of course in the political context in which it was filmed and, um, and both of course are great movies and both have um, simulated discussion um, uh, for many many generations and if our if our movie could could stand in that pantheon I, 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 it'd be hard for us to say mm -hmm. anything anything more than that. Mm -hmm. I'm hard pressed, but one that comes to mind is, uh, well, my brother uh, was wounded in Vietnam. He was a Marine. So uh, when Born on the Fourth of July came out, I, had, I, I was very young when he was wounded. So as an adult, all of a sudden I could understand just a little better what he had gone through when he came home and the rehabilitation process. and. And it made me uh, appreciate him all the more. Uh, so it, it really had a profound emotional, personal impact for me. Bless you. Bless oh, you. Ooh, good timing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good I won't shake your hand. <laughs>